Good evening. It's good to be back. I don't know if you remember, but I used to live here. <laughs> so this was my parish for about three years, and I miss you. So I just want you to know if, if um, you're wondering where I'm at, the Lord called me, and um, now I'm living and working day in and day out in Jonesboro as the superior of my community. Um, but they asked me if I would still be willing to come and give talks, and I said, yes, please. <laughs> I know what to do. Uh, this, is, this used to be a scary thing for me to do. Giving talks was scary, but now it feels like home <laughs> compared to what I have. I don't know what to do every day. It's just crazy. I've never been administrating of anything, so um, it's a unique and new position. Each of you are going through new things every day too, right? You know, you began a new school year. You're doing a new thing in your faith. You're growing. You're getting to know who God is. Each day is a little bit new and a little bit unique. But one of the things that we have a problem with in faith in general in our world today is we may have moments where we focus in on what is happening in our life for a moment and then we let go of it and we don't remember anymore. Uh, we may have what some people would call a mountaintop experience. Something great happens. God maybe presents himself to us. We remember him. We get to know him a little better. We have this experience and then we go on. And we remember that one moment, but we don't live it out day in and day out. Now, I'm not trying to say that all of our days should be mountaintop experiences. No, but we should be able to find a moment each day where we touch hands with God where we actually feel we've connected, okay? And so my talk today is about trying to help you find a way to do that. So that even after confirmation, after you've had this experience of getting to know who God is, growing in your faith, maybe even grasping a hold of it and saying, I want it, give me this sacrament so that I can know God better, that, I, that you will then continue to grow and not let go and just move on with life as though this never happened, okay? So I, my goal is to give you some skills, to give you some, something to actually concrete hang on to. So here's what I'm gonna ask of you. And I'm gonna be pretty serious. I want you to separate from your friends. I even want you to separate from your parents. I'd like you to spread out a little bit. And I know you enjoy being with your friends and I'm not trying to say that it's wrong because it's not. But at this moment, we're going to go through a prayer experience. And this prayer experience isn't communal. This prayer experience is unique for you and God. And it's good. it may even feel a little uncomfortable for a second, but if you don't learn to embrace silence, if you don't learn to embrace peace, because it's very peaceful, if you don't, but it's, for some reason in our society today, Peaceful silence is actually uncomfortable. People don't know what to do with a quiet moment and they fill it up with other things. As soon as you get a few minutes in the car, if you're by yourself, what do people do? They turn on the radio. Tune out the silence. <laughs> There's peace in that, but for some reason, we have a hard time accepting that peace because maybe it brings up a few other subjects that we don't really want to think about, so we try to push them away. But if we would just daily take a little dose and deal with some of our little issues day in and day out, they wouldn't get to be so big. We could start chipping away at those little things that we'd like to maybe change in our lives or that relationship that's not quite what we like it to be. We could talk to God about how, how we feel about it. And it wouldn't be quite so overwhelming because it's not been, you know, a month since I sat down and talked to God. So I'm going to ask you right now, go ahead and stand up, separate, even spouses. I'm going to ask you to kind of scoot apart, separate from each other for a second. Just get a little space for yourself so that you don't feel you're not, um, you're not responding to the person next to you making a noise or or hitting your leg or something like that, separate out. 
The more you know God, the closer you will be to the people you love. So let me repeat that again. The more you know God, the closer you will be to the people you love. Because he will be the closeness between you. So you have to have these moments where you get to know him. So if you brought, us, if you brought your Bible, well, actually, we're going to do a, a guided meditation, no scripture. I'm going to talk about multiple ways of praying today. When I was your age, the way I prayed, memorize prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And I didn't really think about what I was saying. I remember the retreat I was on where we walked through the Our Father. I think I was 20 years old. And it was the first time I sat down and spent an entire two days, every time we stopped to pray, we used one section of the Our Father and they broke down what those words meant. All those years I'd been praying the Our Father and had just been rolling it through my mouth and not thinking about what the words actually meant. So the Our Father is a beautiful scriptural prayer that you can use, but you shouldn't just rattle it off. If you're going to use it as a prayer that unites you to God, you need to spend some time on it. Say it slowly. When you kneel down, when you first come in church, kneel down and actually say the words slowly to the Lord, thinking about what they mean. The, the Hail Mary, the rosary, beautiful prayer. And I will say this, I can get on board on however you want to pray it. If you're one of the people who likes to run through the Hail Mary really quickly, I can pray it that way. If you like to pray it really slow, I can pray it that way. Because there's two different things you can do during the rosary. You can meditate on the, on the actual, um, it, there's a meditation that goes along with each decade. You know, the, the um, I just went blank. Mystery, that's the word, the mysteries of the rosary. So you can actually, so whatever speed the people are going praying the Hail Mary, if my mind is taken up with meditating upon um, the Annunciation or um, uh, Jesus um, dies on the cross and I'm, I'm thinking about what that's like and I'm experiencing it in my mind. The words that I'm saying are, are verbal, but my mind is with God, right? In that moment, my mind is with God. Because we can do two things at once. How many people have ever been to Mass and realized that oh my gosh, Mass is almost over and I just knelt down. I've been thinking about something else the entire time. This can happen. Yes, this can happen. We're so into whatever's happening before we walk in the doors of church that the problem or the issue that was going on in our lives, whatever happened at school, whatever student we're talking to, uh, is around us that's causing us troubles, we can't get our mind off of it. And before you know it, we've been saying the words to Mass, but thinking on something else. So the rosary is really a perfect meditation. It gives you something to do with both. You can say words and think on something else, but it fills up your mind. It fills both ways. If you do it. <laughs> so you could just say the words and think on whatever your problem is and never get back to Jesus. But one of the things that I want to do is what I call a guided meditation. So I'm going to guide you. You can learn to do it yourself. You can talk yourself through the steps to let go to kind of let your brain let go. We have been meditating, we're, you know, the, um, these uh, kind of new age meditation techniques are not new. Um, people, Christians, have been meditating since the beginning of time. Praying with God has been our thing as Christians. It is our thing. But we've kind of let go of it, and we think that the only people who are kind of wrapping their minds around meditation are the kind of strange new age people. No, no, we should all be wrapping our mind around the peacefulness, the love, the mercy of God on a regular basis. Letting go of our own stress, letting God heal us up. Okay, so I'm going to ask that you close your eyes. You might feel weird, but this is what I want you to do when you're in your home, when you go to your room, when you're um, having a bad day, you close your door to your bedroom, you go in there, you turn everything off, you turn off your phone, you put it on silence and do not disturb. 
and you take 10 or 15 minutes to be quiet, to dedicate 10 minutes to 15 minutes for God. You have to start with five, start with five. But I'm going to actually take three solid minutes and I'm going to time it. It's going to feel like forever. Do it this way. Three solid minutes of silence. And during that silence, I just want you to breathe. I want you to concentrate on like breathing in and breathing out. And when you breathe out, I want you to actually tell your brain, relax. Relax. And we're going to do that for three minutes. And then after three minutes, I'm going to have you close your eyes and I'm going to talk you through a conversation with Christ. It's going to be unique to you. I'm not going to tell you what to say, but I'm going to tell you what to do in your mind. I want you to think of a place where you feel safe, a place where you enjoy being there. It's comfortable, it's relaxing, it's safe. You could hang out there as long as you want to. Now I'd like you to talk to God. In your mind, just say hello. Talk to him for a second. Invite him in to the conversation. Now 
Ask him if he'd like to join you in your safe place, in your favorite place. What would you like to say to him? Tell him whatever you'd like to say. It's okay if you don't know what to say. It's okay to just sit with him too. It's okay to just let him be. And it's okay to invite him to speak back. Would he like to say something to you? Tell him how you feel. How do you feel about things these days? Now tell him thank you for the moment. Even if he didn't physically appear to you, even if he was just there in presence and spirit with you, tell him thank you. If you'd like to show him some sign of your affection, you may do so. When you're done, you may open your eyes. That's something we can each and every one of us do at home by ourselves. It took us like seven minutes, nine minutes, somewhere in there, seven to nine minutes. And if you had more time and you were really having a conversation or something really going on in your life, a situation that happened that day that you needed to talk out, he would listen. And I'm telling you, he hears you and he wants to know and he wants to talk back. He wants to be given the opportunity. He doesn't always speak back, but sometimes he does. Sometimes it's like sitting with somebody you love and you just wanna be by them. You just sit next to them. You don't have to, you know, sometimes it's nice just to watch TV with a family member, watch TV with a friend. You don't have to be speaking. You're just with each other. You're there. You're present to each other. We need to do that with God. We need to be present to him. We need to have the hard conversations with him, 
but we also just need to sit with him and show him that he, we care enough about him to do that, to give him time. So I have another form of prayer that I find very important. Um, we as Catholics have a tendency not to use our scripture very often, our Bibles. And, but I, I say this, we don't get the actual Bible out very often. But we really do use scripture a lot. The, almost the entire mass, not verbatim, but a very large percentage of the mass is verbatim from scripture. And if you ever, um, let's say you, you may not use your Bible, but you do a, medi a meditation for the day. Maybe you get an email or a text that's a meditation for the day. That's scripture usually. These are things being sent to you. You can sign up for them. I get an email every day with a link that takes me to the daily readings and a little um, meditation video that I, I read every day um, to start my day off. But I'll tell you, there's one piece of scripture that is really easy. And I don't know if you, if you get, if anybody in your house gets like a little missalette or a missile, but you know that Right before the gospel's read, we sing Alleluia. We all stand up and we sing some version of Alleluia. And then they chant like one line, maybe two. And then we sing Alleluia again, the, the, the gospel acclamation. Okay? It's right before the gospel. So there's the first reading, then there's the responsorial psalm, then there's a the second reading, and then we all stand up singing Alleluia's. And then there's a scripture were a little tiny verse it's usually a super duper packed verse if you ever wanted to like think on one piece of scripture that one line is usually a pow so I, i'm just going to read to you the one for today so this was the the gospel acclamation that we had today it's from luke chapter 3 verse 4 and 6 Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. You could meditate on that for a week. It's just that one passage is enough to think on and try to figure out what God's wanting from us in that one passage. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. It's called Lexio Divina. It's a Latin term for divine reading. It's, it's kind of the Benedictine claim to fame. It's our way of praying, okay? So there's the Ignatian way of praying, and there's uh, just like rote memorization, like rosary praying. And then there's personal prayer, which is kind of what you just did a combination of with that meditation I just did for you. You were talking to Jesus using your own words. That's a, that's a prayer of your words to Christ, a conversation. But this is using the words of God in his scripture to have him talk to us and then we use our words to talk back to him. Okay, so I gave you a little holy card. If you pull out that little holy card, it's got a picture of Jesus on it and on the back, really tiny writing, but I had to get it all on there, um, is some steps. So these are kind of some steps to walk through. If, if you're the kind of person who likes to know, like, what are the steps? How do I do this? It's helpful for some people. If it's not helpful for you, that's okay. <laughs> you don't have to use the steps. But it really does help um, so that you don't... Here's what can happen. Let's just be honest. What can happen in prayer is I read the passage and then it's all about me. <laughs> And I just talk to God about me, and I 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 talk to God about me, and me, and me, and me, and what do I need, and what do I need, and what do I need, and maybe what my friend needs, but then really what do I need, what do I need, <laughs> maybe grandma, and then, <laughs> you know, we can really get focused on me. <laughs> but if you do some steps, it makes you kind of stop for a second, think about what God would have to say, because it says, don't, don't talk, don't talk. <laughs> listen, listen for a little bit. And you can even time yourself out. That's what I have to do. I have to say, stop, time myself out. You can't think for five minutes. And if I start talking, 
I have to stop. <laughs> you know, I tell myself this so that I, I will turn it off so that I can hear God's voice for a second because I can't get the wheels to stop sometimes. So what they say to do is what's called Lexio, which is to read. So you read the text slowly um, after settling in. So you do like the breathing thing. I, I know it seems crummy, but do you not feel more relaxed? After you breathe for a little bit and just be quiet, your body kind of relaxes and you get into a new mode. It's a new way of thinking. Um, so you settle in, you quiet yourself, you find this one little small passage in scripture, and you read that scripture passage very slowly and prayerfully. Maybe for like a minute, you let it sink in, you try to think about it. Maybe you read it two or three times, read it over and over again, kind of putting it almost to memory, like you would practice saying something, so that it's, you're, you're hearing what it says. It's not, it's not being done quickly, it's being done with thought. And then you try to find one little piece that speaks to you. So go ahead and open your Bible to Luke chapter 3. Go ahead and see if you can find Luke chapter 3 in your Bible. Does anybody need one? Got a whole bunch right here. Come on up. Just come get here. Come up and get them if you need a Bible. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you haven't practiced with your Bible in a while, usually at the very, very front... Let's see. There's a page that has the Old Testament and the New Testament. So this one is um, in the like third page on this one, and it tells you where what page Luke starts on. So if you need to find Luke, you go to the very front of your Bible, you look for Luke in the New Testament. get to Luke, then we're going to go to chapter 3 of Luke, verse 4. Luke chapter 3, verse 4. And I'd like you to read chapter uh, verse 4 and verse 5 and 6. And find, read it slowly, two or three times. Kind of thinking about what's he trying to say. What does God have to say? So the version we have is, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths. After you've read it two or three times, you're going to do what's called reflection or meditation. This is where you actually um, try to figure out what you think God is trying to say to you using this one passage. What does this passage mean to you? What's he trying to say here? In general, what's he saying? But, it, but what does it mean to me as a person? If God himself were saying this verse to me, what would it mean to me? Is there one specific grouping of words that mean the most? Like, for me, I love prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. I love the words prepare the way of the Lord, but the part that means something most to me is make straight his paths. That means something to me. There's more to that. I, I feel it in my heart that that's meant more for me than prepare the way of the Lord. I'm supposed to do some, there's some things I need to do. I, I need to do some things to prepare and to make straight his paths. To straighten, uh, maybe, I, I feel like there's a few little spots in my life that are kind of curvy right now and I need to straighten them out. <laughs> I need to quit stepping off the path 
and get on the straight and narrow. <laughs> He's asked me to do some things I've been avoiding. <laughs> so is there something in that passage that speaks to you? And you may want to go to the next line. If it doesn't, if the first line doesn't. But don't go very far. Verse 4, 5, or 6. All right, now we're going to do what's called responding or oratio. It's a form of prayer. You take what that passage said to you and you sit with it. This is where you talk back to God. You, you give him something. You give into the conversation. You're, he has said these words to you. You figured out what you think they mean and what he's trying to say, what he's what his saying in his language, and you speak back to him what you have to say about that. So we're going to take a few seconds to go ahead and do that, okay? So I want you to tell him what it means to you. If you sense God speaking to you in your thoughts or feelings or imagination, you would, you would respond just like you would in any conversation. You just talk to him in your mind, telling him what you think it means and if you think anything about it. So I'm going to give you just a few minutes to do that. This last step is sometimes the one we forget the most, okay? It's the one that people tend to get antsy and want to be done and be finished and just go on. But it's called resting or contemplatio. It's where you actually get into a place of contemplation. It's where you sit quietly after you've just told him your part. Now you sit with him. You sit with him in silence. This is the little bit sometimes uncomfortable part because we really want him to talk back the whole time, but really he needs us to be comfortable in silence. He's really helping us to learn to be comfortable in our own skin, to be okay with who we are. And he'll love us, but in a deeper place that's silent inside our hearts. Sometimes, occasionally, we might hear a word from the Lord that's just like, you hear it in your head. It's, I, I, didn't, I didn't make that up, but... It's only probably happened to me a couple times, two or three. For the most part, it's me sitting with the Lord in this period, 
gently letting him work in an inner place in my heart, healing maybe the wounds that have come up as I've thought about and prayed about things, or the relationships that I'm in that I'm dealing with, just letting him do whatever he wants to do for a few minutes. So we're just going to be quiet now. I'm going to try ask you to just not, no more conversation on your part. Just listen. Just sit quietly. If you need to do the meditation where you think of God sitting next to you, that's a, something I do sometimes. I actually picture him in my mind sitting next to me. And we just sit there. And if he wants to whisper, he can. If he wants to not, he doesn't have to. So it doesn't have to take a long time. But I'm going to practice one more because if you don't do another one, you're going to forget this. <laughs> okay? So we're going to do one more. And this time I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. So this is Christ. Okay? So when it says, but he said to me, it's but when Christ said to me. So it's Christ saying to me. So we'll read that. But Christ said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. That's it. That's the sentence. I want you to read it three or four times and see if there's a word or a phrase or the whole thing that's speaking to you. Is there a piece or a part that's jumping out at you as more important. But Christ said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. Now, I want you to meditate on it, reflect on it. What is God trying to say to you? What does it mean? He's speaking these words. These are Christ's words to St. Paul. But right now they're to you. Christ's words to me. What are they meaning? What is he trying to say? Are you having, have you ever felt like you were weak? Have you ever felt like you didn't know what to do? If you didn't, you weren't, didn't have the answers, you weren't able to do something, but God was asking you to do it? For me, it was just to pass the grade. <laughs> <laughs> when I was your age, I felt like there was no possible way that could happen. I, I didn't do well in school. It was a struggle every day. I felt like a weakling in a lot of ways. So I know what that feels like. I was barely passing most every semester. But what does it say? My grace is sufficient for you. For power is made perfect in weakness. What's he trying to say?
Tell him about it. Tell him what you think. Now we're going to sit with it. We're going to sit with it, and we're going to let him sit with us. Okay, so those are my two passages. There's so many more. I actually have more on my page. Um, It is up to you. I'm going to try to look at each and every one of you. It is your responsibility at the end of this to have a relationship with Christ. Okay? You're the only one who can say yes or no to your relationship with God. He's there. He's ready. He's willing. But you can shut the door or you can keep it open. He's always ready. He's willing. He's knocking. But you don't have to open it. So it is up to you to decide if you're going to do it. This is one way to have a relationship How many friendships do you have where you don't talk to the person and you're like best buds? If you don't ever speak to somebody, how close are you really? You might even love them, but you're not really close. So you can honestly say, I love God, but not know him at all. And was it not scripture just a few weeks, just a few days ago that said, You can say, Lord, Lord. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the gates of heaven. Just because you say, Lord, Lord, or just because you feel love, doesn't necessarily mean that you know him, and that you've spent time with him, and that you have a relationship with him. Okay? You really, really need to think about how are you going to incorporate this relationship into your life. You don't have to be a nun to have a relationship with Jesus. You don't have to become a priest just to know who Christ is. Everybody, everybody is called to know him in whatever vocation they've been called to live. No matter what it is, we're called to be close to him and have him. He wants to be in our pocket. He wants to be that one thing that we always have, that we're never alone, that we've always got somebody on our side. We should never feel like we're alone. Okay? So if you take nothing from this, even if it's just praying the rosary, if you don't use any of these meditation techniques that I've given you, that's okay. That doesn't bother me. It's the relationship that you have with Christ. I'm trying to give you ways to get to know him, ways to feel the peace that Christ can give. But if that's not your way, that's okay. The most important part is, do you spend enough time with him in some capacity to have a full and good relationship with God? Your side, because his side is always there. That's what I always say about my relationship with Christ in my vocation. If there's a mess up in my vocation, you can guarantee it wasn't the other one. You know, when people are married, sometimes the spouse really can be a problem. (laughs) But in my relationship, the spouse is never the problem. (laughs) If there's a problem, I only have one person to look at. (laughs) I messed it up. Now, I will say this. I do belong to a community. And so we can have issues in community also. And it's a family kind of situation where there can be issues inside those people in the relationships. But... The primary relationship is with God. And so 
He's the one that glues us all together. All right, do you have questions? Now you can come back together with your friends if you'd like and sit together. You don't have to sit separate or you can stay there, whatever you wanna do. But if you have questions, things you'd like to know about me, about my way of life, about prayer, I don't care, about what I did before I became a sister, I'm willing to answer, you've got me for a little bit longer. <laughs> Adults, you're, you're welcome to ask questions, too. <laughs> All right. You do? It's pretty, it can get long, but okay. Um, I do have a, a, a story. Each of us have our own story. Um, I guess I would say for this age group, one of the things I'd like to tell them is I didn't know I wanted to be a sister when I was your age. I wasn't one of those little kids growing up that said, I'm gonna be a nun someday. You know, I actually didn't like sisters. <laughs> um, I had sisters in the first and second grade and they were really old and um, old school in their format of punishment. So I was kind of scared of them. Um, and I didn't, I used to run the other direction when I would see a sister. Like some people run to me and I always think, oh, the world is a new place because I would have been running the other way <laughs> if I had saw a sister coming. Um, I was a little scared of sisters. So the concept of being, like when, I, when people would ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up, it was never a sister. Um, I wanted to be an, a, a, a nurse. Um, but I'll be honest, people would say, why didn't you want to be a doctor? I could barely pass grade school. <laughs> and I knew you had to go to school forever to be a doctor. And I was really petrified to even to be a nurse. Let me just tell you how, if you're having a hard time in school, don't let it, don't let it beat you down because um, it almost stopped me from going to college. Um, but what I did was I joined the United States Air Force and I became a medic. And in the United States Air Force, they put you through um, training to be a, an EMT first. When you do medic school, they do an EMT program, nationally certified EMT, and then they do some on-the-job training for wartime and things like that, so you get ready for that. And I really, it was like, one, I grew up. I think my brain needed an extra year to mature to the level I needed to get to to get there. Um, and I realized I liked this. It, I found something, you know, they only gave me one semester of health. In all the 12 years I went to school, I got an A for the first time in my life. I took health and got an A. So I think there was something about that. I'm flunking, 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 A, flunking, flunking, flunking. <laughs> um, so, I, but the military also was very hard for me. It took me out, even though I say I didn't want to be a sister, I was, I kind of always loved the Lord. And I'm hoping I'm talking to a group of people that feel that way. There were times when I questioned, I'm not going to lie, there were times when I questioned, you know, was I in the right church? How do we know who Jesus is? Uh, how are the rules the way they are? I mean, I had to go through all those steps. Those are good steps. Everybody should go through them and study that out. It's important. Um, but when I was in the military, I ran into people who vast majority didn't practice any faith. I don't know where you go to school. I don't know if you live in that world, but I grew up in a small town. Um, we weren't all Catholic, but the majority of us were. And if you weren't Catholic, you were Christian. And so I don't even think I knew a non-Christian growing up. And so this, I kind of it was a beautiful way to grow up. And sometimes I consider it Mayberry. It was a little bit Mayberry-ish. <laughs> um, and I really wanted out of the bubble. I thought I really wanted out and I was excited to get out and to learn about the world. But it was kind of scary and I really didn't like it once I got out there. And I quit going to church for a little while. Um, there aren't many people who go to church by themselves. It, for me, church was a family affair. And when I joined the military, nobody went to church. 
I didn't have a family, I didn't have a group, it felt very lonely. So please, when you see young people sitting by themselves, if they look like they'd like somebody to sit with them, sit close and offer them a friendship. <laughs> they need it. Um, so finally, a friend of mine who was not Catholic, who was um, non-denominational, invited me to her church. And I went. And for me, it was a lot of fun. But it felt like a pep rally for Jesus. And that was awesome. I, I'm, I'm a cheerleader by like nature, <laughs> not necessarily reality, but I, I, I am like rah-rah and happy person. Um, <laughs> and so it felt like that party for Jesus and it was great. But I remember immediately when Karen dropped me off, I jumped in my car and I ran to the local parish because I was like, I'm ready for mass. It was the pep rally before the game. <laughs> That's what it felt like. Like I had prepared myself by doing praise and worship and by praying and, and getting into the word and then I needed to go to the game. <laughs> um, and so for me, I, I quickly realized I'm Catholic. I am Catholic and I believe. It took me a bit of a, uh, you know, I, I did some study. I fell in love with scripture during this process. Uh, the Pentecostal non-denominationals so they called themselves, but they were very Pentecostal. <laughs> they gave me a Bible. Just gave me one. It was leather bound. It was nice. It had gold lettering. <laughs> Handed it to me. I don't know how much that thing cost, but I, I wonder sometimes. It had tabs so I could figure out where I was at. Um, I started reading scripture. It was wonderful. It was a gift from God. Most people don't get it. I still don't have it. I wish I could get it back. Because I could read this like, like it was Harry Potter or something. Like I couldn't put it down. <laughs> it was so cool. Um, I would read for hours. And then I realized, oh, that's in the Mass. Oh, that's in the Mass. Oh, everything we talk about is Jesus. <laughs> I'm good. We're good in the Mass. You know, I, be, I realized I am Catholic. Um, then when I, I got out of the military, um, Went home, went to nursing school, um, almost flunked anatomy and physiology, and I was really disappointed. And it was a mini semester, like summer thing. I tried to push myself through it. And then I took it for the real deal and made all A's after that. I just said, okay, I gotta go to regular semester. I gotta study, I gotta do my thing. And um, at, for the first time in my life, I was an A student. And I loved nursing. But I felt something unique during nursing school, um, a call to do something more, to be a nurse, but to be a nurse in a different way. And I could not figure this out. I was still working as an ambulance driver on an ambulance crew through nursing school on the weekends. Um, and it just, it was great, but it, it wasn't, I didn't feel like it was what God was asking of me. And so, my last semester of nursing school, I called up the Diocese of Fort Worth. I, at that time, I was living in Texas. I called up the Diocese of Fort Worth, and I said, I think I'm supposed to be a missionary. I, I'm about to graduate from college. Um, I don't have any debt. And I, I want to serve God. I, wanna, I think I was in the wrong army. I think I'm supposed to be doing this for God and not necessarily for the United States government. I, I think I was kind of in the wrong I, I didn't listen when I was 18, <laughs> and I was supposed to do something different. And they said, oh my gosh, we just adopted a diocese in Honduras, and they need a nurse to work in a clinic for women and children at the base of this mountain. They don't have very much. It's really, really poor, but we're trying to set them up, and we're trying to get doctors to go in for like a month, but we need somebody to stay there and to help the doctors when they come pick them up from the airport, show them the patients, give them, get, get the patients in lined up, you know, make sure they get some continuity of care, and, and could you do that? I think this is it. I made one phone call. <laughs> one phone call, and I was signed up for a year. <laughs> um, I left a couple months later, I lived in Honduras for a year, loved it and hated it. I loved the people, loved the way of life, I took my sister who was not called to be a missionary with me and I hated that part. 
<laughs> because I was babysitting. Um, I was 22 and she was 21 and I was babysitting my 21 year old sister who was really boy crazy. But anyway, <laughs> um, and so I chased her all over Honduras is how I felt. <laughs> but um, uh, wonderful time and it was there. It was there that I found my calling. I found uh, religious sisters who for me, it was important. Um, it's not necessarily for everybody, but I felt that the call came, I saw myself in the habit. I knew that was part of my call to wear the habit. And I, I saw sisters in Honduras, it's hot there. I don't know if you know this, but it's hot. And they wore these brown robes and these black veils and uh, they were courted and it was the Franciscan sisters and they didn't go, you know, partially thin material or anything, it was thick. And I was like, if they can do that, surely I can do it in, back in the United States where it's a little bit uh, more temperature controlled. <laughs> um, and they were happy. They were young, they were happy, they were serving God, they were, they were doing things for the world. And I just knew there was something there. And so I read a book, it was like a fiction novel, but one of the main characters became a nun. And I'll tell you, I have, don't even remember the whole story. I just remember this one scene. And in this one scene, um, there was a sister who was kind of, y'all all know Winnie the Pooh, right? Eeyore. <laughs> she was just kind of always down. But she wasn't necessarily, like, that was just her personality a bit, you know? She was just kind of one of those people that's, uh, it's okay, never really happy. But when she entered religious life, the way they described her, was her friends went to visit and they couldn't believe the joy that they saw coming out of her face when she talked to them. And they were just like, what has happened? And she just, she said, I found God's love. And I heard in my head, this is where I tell you I've actually heard God talk. I heard him say, just like you will be. I thought it was the book. I thought I read it. So I, I, was, I threw the book across the room. <laughs> and then I was like, wait, wait, that's dumb. I went back and got the book, found the spot, read it. It's not there. Then I got mad. Because I really didn't want to be a nun. I'm kind of scared of them. <laughs> and um, I started crying. And I kind of threw a fit. And I think I cursed a bit. But anyway, I was not happy. <laughs> and I kicked my bed. I about broke my toe. And... Um, I, I, so then I, I read it again and I was praying and I said, what do you, do you really want this? And I heard him say, yes, that's how you'll be. And I just, I just laid down and cried. I was not ready. I was not ready. It came to me peacefully. So when God speaks to us, he, come, he comes in peace. He doesn't come like angry or mean or, or you know, he comes in peace, but I was not there. And he knew it was going to take like a little jolt to get me there. So I, um, I, I, I cried. I cried for like two hours. The next morning I was a mess. I was all swollen. Anyway, everybody I'm sure knew I was crying. And I pretended it didn't happen. I ignored God for six months. I went to church, but I quit praying. Totally. I just sat in the pew. I just ignored he was there. And I was afraid. I, I thought if I pray, he might talk to me. And then I'm going to have to be a nun. And I'm not doing that. <laughs> and just I, I just totally ran the other direction and um but you know what it felt like you might be doing this so I'm going to bring it up if you're doing this if you're running from God right now it feels like God leaves you and you're alone and I I can only say I didn't know what it felt like to be alone because I had been walking with Christ since my baptism we walk with him and we don't even realize it. We're so accustomed to it. We're so, he's always there. But he, he made me feel the feeling of what it would be like if he wasn't there. So I don't believe he left me. I believe he took away the feeling of his presence. And so for six months or so, that's how stubborn I am, I kept going. <sighs> that's what it felt like. I, like I had, like I had um, um, weights on my feet. Like I couldn't keep going but I was not gonna talk 
to God because he might ask me to do something I don't want to do. And then it finally hit me. Somebody made a comment about how God doesn't do anything without, like he doesn't ask anything of us without giving a hundredfold back. So if you give him one, he gives you 100. If you give him a bit, he takes and he gives more. And I thought, oh, hmm. I still am not ready. <laughs> and then I, I read the story of Abraham and Isaac, and it talked about how Abraham was willing to give back the son that he had in his old age. He was willing to let him die because God had given him, and so God could take him back. And I was like, I'm just wanting to hold on to the possibility of a future, of a, of a marriage or children. I, I don't even know if they're going to ha happen. I mean, this is just like projected dreams, not my person, not actual people that I'm giving up here. He was giving up his actual son. And I thought, what do I need to do? I need to do this. If, if Abraham can, do, can give up his son, can I not give up the dream of a son? Giving up a dream is not easy, y'all. It is not easy. And every single, well, I wouldn't say every single sister, but every single, and every single priest, but probably majority at some point had to give that up. When, when God asks something of us like that, there is a sacrifice that you have to make. You have to agree to the sacrifice. And I, I remember I got in my pew back home. I sat in like a pew right here. And I, I remember laying my family on the altar. Like, I remember thinking, okay, God, there's my mom. Okay, God, there's my dad. There's my two sisters. There's my brother. There's the man. I don't know who he is. <laughs> There's the children I've always wanted to have. There's the nursing degree that I just got. There's, gosh, me. And finally I put me on the altar and I said, kill me, I guess this is it. <laughs> and then I realized it's not it. He gives back a hundredfold. I am in a family. I do have children. I am fulfilled. I'm a mother. <laughs> I, I never dreamed that I would be called mother anything. <laughs> and so I don't have to worry that God hasn't, he's caring for me. All my needs are met. Not always exactly the way I want them to be, but they're all met. And he always gives back. He always provides me what, with what I need. And... Um, and I say that knowing that it could look different tomorrow. So I'm not trying to tell you that it's always like roses. Because your life is not always roses. This is what you're asking for. <laughs> this is what life means. If you choose, he will, he will be with you though when you go through these moments in your life. We will all have moments of sacrifice. We will all have hard times but he will always be by our side he will never stop walking with us and holding up the cross for us and with us okay um and, and so my life is really good i'm not trying to say it's really good but i have 27 women children <laughs> Every single one of them has a different idea on how we should do everything. <laughs> Christmas is going to be a cornucopia of everybody's Christmas ideas. <laughs> it will never be one theme, I promise. <laughs> um, so we, you know, but that's the beauty of Christ and his church. We all come together and we make this beautiful combination of it all. And um, that's what he called me to. He called me to be a piece or a part of that, just as he's called each of you to be a piece and a part of that. Wherever he's placing you today, he'll bring you to that next part tomorrow. Um, another thing, that, another image that, that speaks greatly to me is 
In our baptism, we were given a candle, right? You were all given a candle at your baptism. Well, you spiritually had the light of Christ inside of you. But that candle sometimes only puts off enough light to take one step forward. And that's all he's asking of you. You can't always see what tomorrow is going to bring. You can't always know how tomorrow is going to go. But you can know where to take the next step. And that's forward with Christ. Okay? All right. Any other questions? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.